Hello and well met. This is Laren from the Fantasy Grounds Academy. Today I'm going to go over some things that are pretty much overdone. They've probably been done a hundred times, but um, nothing beats a little bit of inspiration, resources, and some research into whatever game or topic that you're going to be um, presenting. So I'd like to show some things that are in Lost Mind that I think might be um, overlooked or perhaps they may have been covered already. I think these are important things that uh, one might include once you get more comfortable with the Fantasy Grounds background and, and it's the way it works and how how the um, mechanisms connect and, and those sort of things. So without further ado, let's take a look at this. So I'm pulling up a third party map. This was created by Game Tile Warehouse by Chris McDermott. And what this is, is basically a remake of the Sword Coast in a sense, but re-envisioned into his own view. Um, this has the um, locations on here for like the Goblin Ambush, and then there's also the uh, map of Phandalin on here. So what I've done is I've linked uh, an additional map that is not part of the original content. This is the Goblin Ambush that happens in the first chapter of the Lost Mine of Phandelver um, episode. And as you can see, I got some dead horses on here. These are some assets that I had found. Um, so they're bleeding and they're kind of laying on the on the ground here. So we're setting up the scene. Uh, the map to the Sword Coast is linked for convenience. And then over here on the left, I also have the actual ambush, which are these goblins here. And they're already pre-placed. Pre also, the little token here has been replaced to update the the, the generic pogs, basically. So what happens is when you actually start this encounter, when you hit this down arrow, the goblins are actually already on the map. However, I want to take this one step further and I want to add some things here to kind of make this encounter more meaningful and a little bit more detailed. So let's pull up the actual encounter itself from the module. So I have some notes that I created and I want to go to the index or the goblin arrows. This is the, the ambush part. So the ambush reads as following. So if you click here on this little text bubble, it will send this to the chat as the GM. And it says you've been on the Tribor Trail for about half a day. As you come around the bend, you spot two dead horses sprawled 50 feet ahead of you blocking the path. Each has several black feathered arrows sticking out of it. The woods close press to the trail here with a steep embankment and dense thickets on either side. So what this is telling you is that there are some, um, you know, some trouble ahead. So some players might look at this as foreshadowing or a clue as to what, what may occur to them. And also it kind of hints that there's, you know, been some kind of calamity here. So um, if you read further in the GM section, it says if you're using the Meet Me in Vandalin adventure hook, then any character who approaches to make a closer investigation can identify the horses as belonging to Gundren Rockseeker and Sildar Hallwinter. It says they've been dead for about a day, so they're talking about the horses, and it's clear that the arrows killed the horses. When the characters inspect the scene closer, read the following. So once they get closer to the horses, they'll notice some saddlebags. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the text, and it says the saddlebags have been looted. Nearby lies an empty leather map case. And then after that, it says four goblins are hiding in the woods, two on each side of the road. They wait until someone approaches the bodies and then attack. So then you click on the encounter, and that brings that up. So this is the original encounter that came with it, and this is the modified so I made a copy of this in Fantasy Grounds and just modified it to my own taste. One thing I did is I turned off the identification. So when they see these, they're going to see small green humanoids instead of goblins because this may be the first time they've ever adventured. The other thing you can do to help with this story is if you read further into this, it actually tells you how this is to play out. So this is very key to this encounter. It really helps if you know 
what to expect ahead of time. And the way this module is written is for new GMs, so it's a lot easier for you to get into the actual story and to not worry about too many of, you know, what do I do, what I do, so you don't get all freaked out and panic. So the, the main thing is that you want to kind of get familiar with the story. One of the things that I do is I'll make this little run list, and I'll read just up to the point where the characters or the players are going to find the Kragma hideout. That's a pretty good uh, segment. Because basically what you're doing here is you're going to go from Neverwinter, which is somewhere up here in the north, travel along this uh, King's Highway, and then turn off to the, the Tribor Trail and, and then eventually into Phandalin. So that adventure right there could just be you getting used to each other, and maybe you will meet some kind of NPC along the way that will inspire you to be cautious or maybe tell you that there's been a lot of problems along the road, whatever you want to do for foreshadowing, and maybe even show a guy with an arrow stuck in his shoulder. I mean, that might might warn the players even before they get to that ambush. So it depends on how you want to run it, but the ambush can be very deadly if your players don't get the jump on the actual encounter. The encounter was written to be an ambush, which I find is kind of strange because you don't really have a map or any sort of tactical way to, to do that. You have to do it theater of the mind. So the way they want you to resolve this is you bring up the stat block of one of the goblins. So what they're talking about in this case is in this encounter, there's a generic stat block that belongs to just all of the goblins. So if you bring that up, it has their stealth, which is plus six. So what it tells you to do is roll that and see if the players are going to be surprised or not. So that's an important element to this encounter. If you're not prepared for that, or if your players are kind of weak or new, this can potentially create a problem for them and, and might even uh, you know, result in at least one death or maybe even a TPK. Depends on how the dice are rolling and depends on the characters you're using. The pregens that come with this are very balanced for this encounter, so anytime you've used this encounter, you can go either way, depending on the dice rolls. Generally, it's in favor of the, the players a little bit, but not so much. So the main things, the main takeaways here is that they want you to look at the stat block and roll their stealth modifier. So you're going to see or check who, if anyone, is surprised. The party cannot surprise the goblins, but the goblins might surprise some or all. So you make a dexterity stealth check for the goblins, rolling once for all of them. So since this is a ambush, that makes sense. So I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop this particular stealth roll, which is on the stat block. Just drag and drop it into the dice tower or into the chat window before the players connect. So I rolled a 14 plus a 6, so that's a 20. So if you have the standard characters on the party sheet, and then you also have the the regular, um, you know, balanced party, what you're going to find is that if you go to the party sheet, which is part of where you would add these to the campaign, all of their passive perceptions are 13 or below. So that would definitely... Um, create a surprise round for the goblins and in which the players cannot do anything for that turn. They basically lose their turn. So that could be a breaking point for your party. So you got to be careful for that. So you can forgo this if you want or just roll a regular initiative roll to see who goes. So, but this is what, how they wrote the adventure. So you got to kind of keep that in mind. If you have a higher level party like second or third level, you might be able to pull this off easier. But you got to be careful because every time they do damage, they can do up to, um, looks like 1d6 plus 2 slashing damage. So that's based on their decks because that's a finesse weapon and the same thing with their, with their short bow. So the way this is designed is you go to see who's surprised, if any, by all the goblins. And if they are, then you will use the surprise rule and as a result, Anyone who's surprised loses your turn during the first round of combat. So you use the initiative rules in a rule book to determine who acts first, second, third, so on. You keep track of everyone's initiative count in the margins of this book or on a separate piece of paper. Well, in Fantasy Grounds, the combat tracker already does that for you. So you don't have to do that part, which is nice because it already 
takes care of that. So that is basically the the main first part of this is that you you have this um, you have this ability to track these things without having to resort to anything like that. Now the next thing is once you've determined that and you've rolled initiative, see now the players have their initiative here already because I've rolled them. But if you wanted to re-roll or start over, you can always go to the menu and you can go to initiative and clear all the initiatives. And then if you had any damage or expiring effects that you want to clear, you can always go to the menu and go to delete effect or you can go to rest and long rest the whole group just in case they've used some of their spells. So that kind of resets everything. And I have these characters on here that are higher level. So these are like third level. I think these were, no, these are first level. So these were revised for this particular adventure. The revised characters that are now in the module are much better, but these are the ones that I created for this particular scene. And then over here in the party sheet, these are not even the same uh, party members. So you want to make sure that that matches. So if I'm going to use the party sheet, I got to go and make sure that I, I clean this up. So this, this party sheet here is, is no longer valid because these are actually the older characters that came with the module. And you notice they didn't even have any portraits. So I'm going to drag and drop these particular combatants on here and I noticed that the um, tokens are not coming up because I don't have a, a token assigned but if you drag it over it, it'll do it so this is going to be their token for now and their particular um, this is their portrait so the same thing with this if I drag and drop this over that just kind of becomes their portrait so the little tokens are going to be their portraits for now so I didn't go in and change those, but one important thing with your, your group is they might want to supply their own portraits. So you'll have to help them with that when the time comes. But for the sake of this, I'm just going to drag and drop the, the token over to the portrait. So it just temporarily becomes like their, their uh, portrait instead of having an actual token or a, a uh, picture. So that is that. So once I've done that, I've added all the players onto the party sheet. So again, you're still looking at their passive perception, and you notice that they don't have quite the passive perception. There are some other things in here that can happen before this combat even starts. So one of the things is that um, when the time comes, the, the goblins will act. Two of them are going to rush forward and make melee attacks. So basically, they're going to be using their scimitars. The other two are going to stand back 30 feet, and they're going to attack with ranged attacks, which is going to be their bow. The goblin's stats contains all this information needed to resolve this. So if you go to any one of these um, goblins, you'll have the scimitar and the crossbow. When you add this to the combat tracker, these attacks will become available to you. You can drag and drop the attacks straight on to the combat tracker entries without even needing a battle map. So that's kind of cool. And that's the way it was initially designed to run. You don't necessarily have to have a fancy battle map like I have here. You can use an image. Uh, you can use whatever you want in regards to that. I've actually used this image quite a bit to sim or stimulate or simulate this actual encounter. So I just open this up, unlock it. And I'll put like a, a grid on there and then maybe turn it up to 60 feet so that way it's or, or 60 so instead of 50 that way you can see it a little better. And then the tint of it I would turn down just a touch so it's not too obnoxious. So you can technically use this instead of using the this big uh, fancy colorful map or just use Theater of the Mind and run everything out of the combat tracker. So there are some things that you can consider before this even happens. So when you are approaching it says here that if you're meeting uh, if you're using the meet me and vandal and adventure hook then any player who approaches to make a closer investigation can identify the horses as belonging to your patrons uh gundren rockseeker and sildar hallwinter so if that's the case i would actually potentially create a role or a need for a role 
that would allow for a player to identify these horses. So I might make the challenge rating like 10 or something like that. And if they roll over, then they'll immediately recognize the horses as belonging to them. So you can add a roll in there to make that more interesting. So in my notes here, I want to go ahead and add that as a, as a potential thing that I want to add. So this is adding to the overall um, flavor and the difficulty of this encounter. So if their players are new, I probably just give them that information. If the players have played before and they're very familiar, I would make them roll for that information. So investigation of at least a, um, a DC 10 or higher, maybe even a DC 11, but I think DC 10 is fair. That's an average there. It's not hard. It's not easy. So investigation of of that would would definitely definitely help that. So that's something that you might you might add to this to kind of to help. Now, th if they if they roll an investigation check, they're gonna uh, learn that the horses belong to their their patrons, or at least they did. So that is one outcome of this. Now, there are other ways you can handle this. It says that um, the horses have been dead for about a day. So that just tells you about. That doesn't actually tell you what it's like um, or, or what the actual number is. So you can make up that. And if they do a medical check, so if they do medicine and they roll, let's say, over a 12, they might learn the exact time of death. So like a forensic thing. So they learn the um, the exact hour or time of death based on the uh, flies and the larva that are starting to form on the horses. So they're going to get kind of a forensic type medical opinion on that. And that's a DC-12. Now, the other thing is maybe a survival check. So this would be related to the arrows. So if someone makes a survival check instead, you can make, do make a DC 11, and they would learn that basically the arrows belong to a local goblin tribe. So they learn that the black feathered arrows belong to a local, um, a local uh, goblin tribe called the Kragma goblins. So they learn that the black feathered arrows belong to the Kragma goblins. So th these are different things that you can do um, to enhance the game. And you don't have to do this. You can just give them the information like it says here. But I think it kind of adds more realism or at least more immersion so that you're actually rolling dice and not just giving them everything. Now, that's one of the things I wanted to point out. So th these can be added in. So if you're a, um, you know, kind of an experienced GM or you want to try something different, if you run this module a hundred times, you may want to do something like that to help um, get rid of the monotony of it. So this is something that I would add in if I felt it was needed or, you know, I would just have it on the ready in case you want to do something like that. And that kind of gives them more investment into what happened. Um, so that's part of it. And then the other thing is the way the encounter is set up in Fantasy Grounds or even in the face-to-face the -face book is you got four generic uh, tokens and you have four combatants. So what I would do with this actually is unlock it. And I would break this up into two groups. So I'm going to go with two. And then I'm just going to copy and paste this particular link straight into here and put two more. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call these uh, melee. And this helps with the actual encounter. So there's melee goblins and then there's the ranged goblins. So that's just a way to kind of separate them. And the little token that I'm using is actually a guy that has a, a scimitar. So I'm going to look for another token in my assets. So this is assuming that you have some alternates. So if I go to my assets under tokens, I'm going to actually go to my data folder because I know I have a bunch of them. And I have Bernardo's token, so he has a ton of really cool ones. 
And then I have a folder that I made called Goblin Kin, and I can look in there and see if there's a bow ready um, NPC token for. Yeah, here's one right here. So there's the bow um, bow wielder. The uh, scimitar guy that I have is is also in here. Um, I believe it is this token here, which is this uh, goblin. Yeah, so that's what I have for the for the melee guys. So I'm going to take this bow one and use this one as the actual token for the ranged goblins. You don't have to change the stat block. You just change the actual token for the encounter, which is not permanent. It's just for this encounter. So I'm going to drag and drop that token up there for the ranged goblins. That changes them, but then it also changes their placement and such. So I need to replace these now. So that is a way that you can kind of make this even more interesting. And then I have one other tip, too, that will tie into this. So um, in the case that you are able to defeat the goblins and you have one escape or survive or maybe you spare one, you're going to have like a, a, a goblin potential for role play where you might actually gain a friend or an ally or you might just have a prisoner of war or whatever you want to do. So what I would do is make him one of the ranged goblins. So I'm just going to take this to one. I'm going to make another copy. And then I'm going to make this guy, this goblin, the goblin runt. So he's going to be like the small dude that uh, basically doesn't really want to fight. And then I'm going to change his token too. So even though he's using the bow, I'm going to change the token to show some kind of you know, like a little little goblin that doesn't look as tough as the others. He's kind of here, kind of by force. I don't think he really wants to fight. So I'm going to go ahead and um, add this goblin kin um, to this. So here's a little dude right here. He's kind of a runt-looking guy, not as tough-looking. So I'm going to use this guy as my runt. So there's still four goblins. It doesn't change the challenge rating or anything. It just gives you a little bit more differentiation between all the different types. So you got the, the one, two range and two melee, basically. The runt is basically the runt. You know, he's a small guy. So he's he's still a, an archer, but he's kind of be shooting from a distance and, and probably going to run away. Because it's one of the things that comes out. It says, when three goblins are defeated, the last goblin attempts to flee, heading for the goblin trail. So that is something that you'll have to um, handle if that happens in your adventure. It is likely that they'll all die, but if they don't, you want to be able to handle that. So in the developments, it says, in the unlikely event that the goblins defeat the adventurers, the goblins will leave them on the road unconscious, take all their their loot and weapons and their wagon, and then they'll go back to the hideout. Um, the characters can continue on to Fandolin to buy new gear, kind of recoup, and then they can go back and find the trail again. Uh, the characters might capture one or more goblins by knocking them unconscious instead of killing them. So a character can use any melee weapon to knock a goblin unconscious. And if you succeed, if the attack deals enough damage to drop the the goblin to, to zero, basically it's an unconscious thing. It regains consciousness after a few minutes, but a captured goblin will share what it knows. So you will skip to a link called What the Goblin Knows. So What the Goblin Knows, there are some things here, some developments that will come out. You'll learn different things, so there are some general things that you'll learn about the goblins' uh, information. There's one, two, th yeah, there's one, two, three, four. So there's four things that you can potentially share with your players. So I wouldn't share all of them. Maybe one, maybe two at the most. If they like, they might try to intimidate the goblin, so that might give him. Um, you know, incentive to, to tell you the information, or you might try to convince them or entice them. So maybe you can get two pieces of information out of them, but I wouldn't give all of these out necessarily unless you feel it's necessary. Because some of these are very revealing. Um, it, it th There's one here, and it says, Clark received a message, a messenger goblin from a from King Grohl a few days ago. The messenger told him someone named the Black Spider was paying the Kragmaws 
to watch out for Gundren uh, Rockseeker to capture him and send him and anything back to King Grohl. Clark followed his orders. Gundren was ambushed and um, taken along with his personal effects, including a map. And then it says the dwarf and his map were delivered to King Grohl as instructed the dwarf's human companion is being held in the eating cave. So as these um, things unfold, what I would do is either make a table that rolls randomly for these four events. So if you go to the tables area and you can create a, just a regular text table, it's not, not that hard. So if you unlock the story entry, you can copy and paste the entries here and make a table out of it. So if you take this and you're gonna go to your tables and then I'm gonna make my own group just in case because I don't wanna uh, mess around with the original. It's not gonna hurt anything, but I want my own chapter or my own section. So it's called group one. So what I'm gonna call this is uh, lost mine um, goblin info table or something like that. This way I, I know what it is and then it's it's separate from from anything else so I, I can find it right away. So that is basically the the new group and then there I'm going to create a new table. So I'm just going to hit the plus button on the bottom right or I can right click and add a new item. And here you already have two slots so let's put um, information as the label and then we're going to add a couple lines here so that'll just be for adding um, these particular entries so we might just go with a 1d4 uh, just by putting the number ranges in here and that will give you that differentiation in there and then just copy and paste the data from the what the goblins know so here, if you click on the What the Goblins Know link, and we have it unlocked in this case, and if, it, you, if it's not unlocked, you can make a copy of the story entry and then unlock it. So you, what I, it says about 15 goblins uh, dwell inside the lair. So I'm going to copy that and just put that here as our choice. So this would be a, a way to... Um, you know, kind of randomize this. Uh, it says their leader is a bugbear named Clark. He only answers to to King Grohl, so we might want to put that in there. Um, so this is something that uh, th this is something that you can add. And then the next thing is even more juicy or more informative. So it says that Clark um, had a map, so we can add that in. And what this is going to do is basically um, add in more of the clues. And then the last thing is telling them what happened to the actual patrons. So I think as this information progresses, it gets more and more revealing. So what I want to do with this is actually weigh the table so it's less likely that they're going to get these last couple bits of information. So what I want to do is let's call this goblin info for the table. Uh, what the goblins know. This way, um, you can call this up and, in case you need to reference it in another table. So we'll just call it what it is. So what the goblins know is basically what it's going to, to infer. And then from there, I want to decide how I want to weigh the tables. So right now, it's spread evenly. So I think what I'm going to do is change this number to 1 to 4. And then this number is going to be 5 to 6. And then this number here is going to be 7 to 8. So let me see. 1 to 4. Oh, this is it. So, okay. So this is going to be 5 and 6. And then this one will be 7 and 7. And then eight and eight. So it's less likely that they're going to roll those results. So if you want to make this randomize, you're basically going to weigh the table to decide what information. So if you want to add that in, you could easily just roll this 
and it'll come out in the story if you want it, or you can have it come out as a story entry instead of in the chat. But this is basically how you would handle this. And then it, they rolled a seven, so they get the juicy information. But in the likelihood that they're rolling here, they're probably less likely to roll any of these other things. So maybe let them roll twice on this table at the most, and that will give them some information about the cave. So that's just a suggestion. You don't have to do that. But this will add to the, I guess, the replay value of the module. So this table here, I might drag and drop this to my research so that if I need to use it, I already have this. So it's it's a lot funner. So I'm going to link this what the goblins know to my research list. So I'm just going to drag and drop it into my notes. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, here we go. So what the goblins know for the Kragma hideout. And then I want to link my new table in case. So that's just giving me a run list of things that I can use throughout the adventure. So that's just something that might help you or it may not, depending on, on what, you, what you're doing in your campaign. But I think that helps with... Uh, giving this a little bit more replay value and, and not so predictive. The other thing that you can do in this case is to actually make a, um, a set of challenge ratings for, for um, getting information. So maybe if you roll a certain number, you're going to get certain results. So again, the same list, but this time you're going to be assigning a challenge rating to each one of these outcomes. So if I come down to here and I hit this uh, unlock button, I'm just going to copy this text. So I want to go, let's see, how do I want to do this? So I'm going to highlight just this text here and then hit control copy. And then I will create my own little, um, my own little story thing. And I'll just do that in my notes. A lot easier to kind of keep everything together. So in this case, this is for the um, the ambush. So we know what this is for. And then this down here is going to be for the actual, for the aftermath uh, or um, for a captured goblin MTC. So we know what this is for. So it's kind of have some labels here. So this information here might be some research that you're doing and you want to add it to the actual game so that it's easier for you to run it later. So that is going to be there. And I'm going to hit, hit uh, control V, which is going to um, paste these in. And what I'm going to do is add the DC challenge rating. So if they roll a DC challenge rating of 10, then that's what they're going to get. If they roll a 12 or higher, you're going to get that. If they roll a, let's say, a 15 or higher, they're going to learn this third thing, and a DC 18 is going to get them closer. So that's basically a way that you can do this. And, and then this can be done with, um, you know, with anything. You can use this as a, uh, you know, it could be... I guess in this in this case you can do um, some sort of uh, role play here, so you can try to convince him. So that's persuasion, and I think persuasion would be a little easier in in that case. So if that's the case, you might want to lower the DC challenge ratings a little. If it's um, by force, so you're threatening him. So intimidation, it might make it even harder. So if it's intimidation, add plus two to the challenge ratings. That way it kind of reflects the type of negotiating that you're doing. So it, it's just a way that you can kind of um, validate what you're doing here. So th this is a good way to, to kind of get people involved and, and kind of uh, help yourself too. Because this will make things easier on you if if you have some content 
and you're not stuck with it. You know, like if you run this a couple of times, it gets kind of boring. So this would help with that too. So that's a good thing to do if you want to um, kind of make this encounter more memorable and also make it a little bit more fair and you're not just giving them the information. So that's kind of what I was getting at is there's a lot of things you can do before this encounter even starts uh, just to start the role playing and buying into the setting and the, and the actual um, the immersion for it. So that's just something that, that I'd advise to do if you are, um, you know, a little bit more experienced or maybe you, you want something different out of this. So that, that's a, a good way to do it. Okay, so the next thing is to place these goblins on this battle map. So it says that there's two melee and two uh, actual, um, you know, these ranged guys. So what I'm going to do is place the goblins on the map ahead of time. So the melee guys, I'm going to put them near the front or closer to where the PCs are. And if you look at these tokens, they're kind of hard to see, but that's that's kind of good too because they blend in with the with the with the scenery. And then also down here, um, I'm going to add another one. So that that'll be the the goblin ambush from here, from this side of things. And then the ranged individuals, put them further down by the horses. Actually, I'll, I'll move these melee guys a little closer. There we go. Huh. So there's the melee guys. And then the ranged individuals can be further up this trail. It said about 30 feet, so we can have them up there. So the little runt, I'll have him up here in the north, uh, by kind of underneath this tree. So that would take and just drag and drop him here and then made him a little bit bigger so we can see him and then this other range goblin will put him over here so i want to move this guy okay and the other range guy i'm going to move him at the end of this row here so there's your your goblins they're placed they're ready to go um this will allow you to give the players time to to approach and to check out the horses so if you need an ox cart you can always find an asset online if you need to i actually have one that i'm going to place on the map kind of give you an idea of some some stuff you can do to kind of make this better there are maps that already have these on there so you don't necessarily have to um paint these on yourself but if you have the assets you might as well use them if you need to so if you're going to use a battle map with this encounter you can actually go into your assets and if you have them in your um, images area you can search for them so i'm just going to go with a uh, cart and i'll see what i come up with i'm pretty sure i have an ox cart yeah so here's some ox carts here um so there's those you can use those as if you want and then i actually had one that had a um the actual ox oxen on there but uh, it looks like i don't have access to it so what i'm going to do is uh i'm going to search my hard drive for a minute so i'm going to go to ox cart so i know i have one um it's something that i had collected with the uh the actual um asset set but if you don't have one you can just use a cart to kind of so there's a, a wooden wheel there's wagons you know you can use something like that to kind of illustrate what you're doing so there's an ox cart in here that we could use to um to kind of illustrate so these are carts and and you can use these to help you show what what you want to do in this particular encounter so if that's the case i want to go up to the um, map itself so i'm going to unlock it and then i want to go to, there's the dead horses on here so those are together there's some blood so we got that there's some more blood so actually these can all go together so so these horses and all that i'm going to put them in a folder so i'm going to call this the horses and then I'm going to drag and drop all of these assets that have to do with the horses into that folder. And then I want to make sure that the horses are on top. So in other words, I'm going to drag them up so that the, the blood isn't necessarily covering them. 
That's what I want. So here's the, the actual assets here. So in doing so, I can drag this entire set now as a set instead of as a um, as a you know a specific. Um, I don't have to drag every single thing here. I can actually drag this entire folder. So I can put these anywhere I want. So I can move these down a little if I need to. Give a little bit more room for the encounter. So maybe like right here. There we go. So there's the horses. Now I want to place the ox cart. So we have the map itself and then all the horse stuff. So now I'm going to go ahead and add this cart here. So just a top-down view of the ox cart. There's supposed to be two oxen. So we'll we'll put these the siege cart up here. So I'm in the layers tool, and I'm going to drag and drop this into the tile section. So I want to go ahead and drag and drop this up here into the tiles. And it's five by three, so that's going to be huge. So maybe only three by whatever. Yeah, two is too small. So. And then if you want to recolor it, you can. You can rotate it. You can do whatever you want. So maybe you want it like this to start with. So I'm going to go ahead and place that on the map. I want to place it kind of more down here in the beginning. So there's the cart there, which looks pretty good scale-wise. I might scale it up a little bit more. So if you want to do that, you want to make sure you're on the layer selection tool. Because if you click again, it's going to draw another tile. You want to make sure that you're not... I'm going to do that. And then you hold down the shift key and you just kind of slightly drag this and that will break, make this a little bigger. So we kind of increased it to four, which I wasn't sure what the scale was going to be because it's going by this outer frame here. So it's hard to tell. But that's why you put it in the tile area first. That way you're not, uh, you're not putting this huge asset on here. Now I'm going to look for an animal. So maybe I have some ox. Oxen. No. So no ox. Let's try cows. Maybe we have some of those. We'll be close enough. Nope, no cows. So that's okay. We'll just pretend they're there. Not a big deal. So we could actually put tokens there in case you want to... Um, do the stat blocks for the oxen themselves. So let's do that. This That would even add to this in case you want to get them more involved with this situation. So if you go to the NPCs, and we're going to look under ox or oxen, and I don't see anything there animal-wise. Let's see if we have the SRD loaded, because that would probably have those in there, animals. So go to the assets under your library. And I'm going to hit the activation, and let's take a look at the bestiary. So we'll load the 5e bestiary, because I know that has a lot of animals in it. I know that the, uh, the other books do too, but I'm more familiar with that, that bestiary. So the bestial bestiaries is uh, what I'm looking at. And if you don't find a... a Maybe there's a cow or oxen. Nope. Let's try a cow. Nope. So you might find something like an animal or a beast of burden or something. You can use a horse if you need to. Um, and that would give you, like, you can use a draft horse as your base and then adjust from there. And then you have a, a token here. Or a horse, but if you don't want to use that, you can use some of the others that just have a letter D. So you can use that as your ox and you can change the token if you want. Not a big deal. But you could use those as your um, as your NPCs to pull along the wagon. So if you wanted to add these in here, you could, and then make them as uh, make them as friendly because they're kind of aligned to you at this time, or at least neutral. And then what you'll do is you place them on the combat tracker and on the map. So if you want to add these, you can. You could just stick them here and here. And see, these are considered large, so they're going to take up more room. But basically, that's that's what you do to add these on if you wanted to. 
So that's just a, a way that you could embellish this map and kind of make it make it you know a little more interesting and funner for you to run. So there you have that. So there's your ox cart and you have your horses. And I don't want this cart on that in that group. So it's going to be separate. Okay. So that's that. So the players can um, put their token on here. So that's another thing is when you place your the initial start here, I'm going to put the rogue inside of the cart. Because usually that's where he'll go. And if you look at the scale of this map, it looks kind of big, like as far as spacing goes. So if I go to the actual grid, I'm at 200, which is what it was probably made for. But I might go with like 180. Um, just to see what that looks like. Yeah, I think 180 is a lot nicer. So that kind of gives it a little bit more room, and it looks a lot more centered. So I'm going to take and drag and drop the the Lightfoot um, Rogue here. So take his token and drag and drop it in there. So he's kind of keeping an eye on the cart, the stuff inside. The Human Noble is going to be up front. So I'll drag and drop him up here. And then the hill dwarf will be up front also. He's the, the soldier. So these two take point. The um, the high elf wizard, she's going to be back here on the side. And then the folk hero, the one that has the bow, is going to be down here in the back. So there's your, oops, that's the wrong one. So that's the human noble. I needed the folk hero. There we go. So there, there's your, your player. So they might be starting off like that on the map. And then this way, when you start the encounter, they'll already be set. And then once the encounter comes up, you bring up the ambush. You send those to the combat tracker, and they will be invisible until you start this round. So that is something that you'll do to get this set up. Now, there's something I wanted to show you in regards to... Um, putting these guys in a map. So now they're going to assume that we're getting ready to run this. So the, the, the big thing here is that when you have this set up this way, it's already placed and you can't see anything right now. But when you hit the down arrow, it will add these goblins to the mix. Now there's some settings in here to help make your life a little bit more entertaining or interesting. One is if you go to the options, up here in top, where it says Turn Auto Center Map. If you want to leave the map open like this and not have it move on you, turn that off. So when you when you go between your your um, players and your NPCs, you don't want that to recenter every time. You want to keep it centered so you can see everything. And that's an important aspect of this. Uh, it, it it can drive you nuts. Your players can change that too. The next thing is um, if you want the combat to be a little bit more interesting uh, for the combat auto NPC initiative right now it's set to on but by default it's set to group so if it's set to group when you add these goblins they all have the same um, the same initiative which isn't always good but it since it's an ambush and if they do get surprised that makes sense but if it's not a surprise attack then it doesn't make sense to me and then as far as the um, NPCs go for their hit points, you have um, an option in the, the actual house rules where you can have random hit points or you can have uh, a fixed or a maximum. So I like the randomized one. So they won't all have the same hit points when you add them to the combat tracker. So we'll hit the down arrow. So now it adds them all to this combat tracker and they all have different hit points and different um, attacks uh, when they go for initiative so the first one to go in this case is going to be this guy here which is the small green humanoid number one or no small green humanoid so if you look at this individual here it's this guy way over here so this is the this is the runt of the of the group so he would go first. But we haven't determined the group yet, the party. So we're going to assume that they were not surprised, as we had discussed before. So I'm going to go to the menu and go to initiative. I'm going to roll for all the players. So this is something you can do as a, 
as a GM if you don't have anyone connected. So now that I've re-rolled, the human folk hero, this one in the back here, is the one that's going to go first. So that's this is how you um, this is how you would start this. So this individual here might hold their attack. So she has a a bow available to her. So what she might do is say, well, she doesn't see anybody, but she knows there's someone out there. So she's going to say, I'm going to pull out my bow. And if I see anyone uh, come out to attack us, I'm going to shoot them with the bow. So she's going to ready an action, basically. So I'm going to click on the ready action. It's just a note that's saying that she's holding her turn until she sees some action. And she might move over a little. So she's going to move, oh, probably 10 feet over. That way she has a clearer shot, and that will help her uh, if she has any targets in mind. So that's that's her turn. And, and then you would go on and click to the next actor. So it would be that uh, the runt. So this guy might actually just, uh, he might move up and then take a, a pop shot at the uh, human noble. So if I hold down the control key and then I click this target here, so I'm clicking on holding the right control key, and then I'm going to click on the noble. And as you can see, it's 125 feet away, so it's a little far. So he'd probably hide and wait, so I'm going to have him hide. So to hide, which is one of their bonus actions, is he moved, and now he's going to hide. So I'm going to roll his stealth, and this way try to maintain his position without being noticed. He's trying to get out of some of the cover, so he's a better shot. So I'm going to go ahead and roll uh, his stealth. And he rolled pretty high, so that's that's against the passive perception of anyone in the group. So he's hiding, and he's getting ready for an opportunity to shoot. So he's going to hold his turn. And then the next humanoid is this one here. This one isn't going to hold off as much, so he's going to go ahead and um, I'm going to hold the control key. He's also going to target the, the humanoid, uh, the no, human noble. So I'm just going to uh, double click on the attack roll for the short bow since he's targeted. And he rolled a total of six, including his bonus. So he missed by a mile. And he's jumping up and down and he's all mad. So I'm going to make him visible. And now he's they know where he's at, basically. So the Lightfoot criminal has the basically has the uh, ability to hide, and he's inside this wagon, so he can duck down. And then he's also next to one of his allies, so he's a, the Lightfoot halfling has the naturally stealthy attribute. So he's going to hide, and he's going to duck down, and he's going to set up a sneak attack. So he's going to target the guy that just made the the shot. Um, and then he's going to roll his uh, stealth. So I'm going to try to give him uh, advantage. So a sneak attack is, is you don't need to have advantage on the attack roll if another enemy of the target is in within five feet of it. Well, there isn't. So in this case, I'm going to have to hide. So I want to take and um, roll his stealth from his skills area. The passive perception on the goblins is like nine. So he should be able to do it, unless he rolls a 1 or something. So I'll drag and drop this into the dice tower. <laughs> he rolled a 10, so he just barely made it over. He rolled a 5, plus his bonus. So he ducks down really quickly and pulls out his bow and gets ready to uh, attack. So he's going to target this individual here. So he has the, the target in his sights, and it looks like he has a pretty clear shot. So he can shoot up and over the draft horse. So what he'll do is stand up at the last minute and shoot. So that'll be his turn. So he's kind of getting ready. Uh, he's getting ready to, to take his shot. So the draft horse is going to stay where it's at. The hill dwarf is going to move forward to investigate. So I'm going to hold down the alt key. And that's as far as you can move this turn. 
he's kind of taking a look around to see what's going on. He says, I think we got trouble. So he's got his shield uh, on his back so he doesn't have the shield out. But he's kind of looking around. So this high elf mage, she knows there's trouble coming up. She senses it. And she heard the dwarf. So in her actions here on her sheet, she is going to cast uh, mage armor. So I drag and drop it onto her. It goes. She gets the bonus of plus three to her armor class. And then I'm going to check off one of her slots. So that that's her turn, basically. She's not moving anywhere, but she's going to put on... She's casting a spell. So this other goblin is going to come out and attack. So he's going to move forward. So in order to move these in turn, you have to uh, basically reveal it. So you have to show it and then hold the Alt key. So he's moved up. And he's going to attack this uh, dwarf. So he's going to take his bow out first, target the dwarf, and take a pop shot at him before he engages him. So he missed. So he, sh he, go he shoots right over the dwarf's head. So that was his turn. And then he kind of shakes his fist like, whoa. Uh, the other horse is staying put. You can roll like a morale check. So like maybe your horses get spooked or maybe the oxen get nervous and they kind of start moving around. So someone might have to make an animal handling check to keep these oxen from moving away. Uh, you have the other goblin that's going to move through the woods. So he's only going to move half his speed. So he's going to move 15 feet. I'm going to roll stealth. Uh, he rolled a one, so he trips and falls and crashes into the bushes, so they know he's there. And he drops his, his weapon, so that's his turn. <laughs> so now the human noble is going to move up. So he's moving up to there, and he's looking in the direction of the goblin. So you got to get an idea of what this could look like if you're going to run this and, and make this your your campaign. So I didn't want to go through the entire battle, but I did want to show you some of the eventualities. So if you defeat these uh, goblins and you keep one of them alive, you can make one of them your pet. So what I've done is basically have these NPCs... And it come from a module that I get off the DMs Guild. So if I go into my library, you can go to the sidekicks of Phandalin. And there's a group of NPCs. You got Milk the Goblin. So you can use Milk the Goblin as your runt. So if he becomes your ally, you convince him to be your friend. You can use this NPC drag and drop him into this this uh, combat tracker and then change his faction to at least neutral and he will be your kind of like your friend you can do something like that so if, if they survive you can do that uh, the other thing is there's a wolf here there's sildar there's garrett goodbarrel there's gundren rock seeker so there's some npcs there that you can use from these other um, modules and then there's some loot so for some reason, this adventure did not include loot for the first encounter. I'm not sure why, but when you actually defeat the goblins and you go to your party sheet, when you're done with the encounter, you could roll, or you can actually go to your experience points section, and then in the actual adventure, you can pull that up, And what you'll see is 
this is the encounter, so you could drag and drop that into the encounters area. So that gives you the experience for defeating the goblins and capturing them or whatever happens. And then there's that table that I had made up for this in case you want to uh, let that little runt tell them some information. And then if they don't, there's some encounters here for a pit trap and a snare trap along the way. And then on top of that, there's finding the Kragma hideout, which is probably your first session there. It'd probably be where you would actually end up um, completing your mission. So I'll just drag and drop this story award in the quest items. So here between these, you got 500 experience that will be divided amongst the party. So this would be in the aftermath of once you're done and you get you find the Kragma hideout. So I'm going to hit award, and that awards the experience points, and it divides it evenly amongst the group. So that's one thing that uh, you can do. But there's no loot. There's no treasure or anything. So to combat that, I have another module loaded in case. You don't have to do this, but it, it helps. So this is the Monster Loot Mines of Fandelver module. It has a bunch of parcels that relate to each NPC type that's in the adventure. So in this actual adventure, I added that to my notes. So here's a, a parcel. And this is based off the goblins. So you might have this times three or four. So this might be something that you would collect over you know, over time or, you know, when you're searching the goblins. Another thing is, I would think they'd have a couple coins. So I'm going to edit this. So they have one gold, two silver, and 11 copper. So this is what they looted off of your, um, your allies that they jumped the night before. They turned in most of the loot, but they kept a few coins for themselves. So that way, you know, it makes this encounter a little bit more memorable and, and, and rewarding for your players. So once you have your loot figured out, and you can make your own too, but that module actually makes it a little easier. So now you already have their goblin teeth, you have a broken short bow, broken shield, broken scimitar. So you can actually drag this over a couple times into the inventory section on the party sheet. So that would add, so you can say that you found enough loot between at least two of the goblins. We'll say the rest wasn't quite even worth keeping. So I drag that loot in here, and I'm going to drag it twice. So now you have doubled up on this stuff here. So that, that's usually pretty good. So when you get to a place where you can actually sell or trade, maybe there's someone along the road, or when you get to Phandalin, you can decide to sell this stuff and, and parcel it out if you want. So maybe the folk hero wants the arrows. So we'll hold on to those. So I'm going to type her name in here. So the folk human folk hero has a bow. So she doesn't want to get rid of those arrows. And also the the rogue uh, in the party has a bow too. So they're going to, but everything else they want to sell except for the teeth. So the lightfoot. He wants to keep the go he wants to keep the goblin teeth, but everything else they want to sell. Now the problem is when you get to town, you're only going to get fifty percent of whatever the value is. So if they are the heroes of Phandalin, you might role play this out and give them fifty five percent because they're the heroes. They they defeated the goblin, so their reputation kind of helps them out here. But let's just say that your party feels a little cheated, like 55%. We, we almost died because of that encounter. So what you could do is talk to uh, the proprietor of the actual um, Baratheon's provisions in, in Fandelver and say, hey, you know, I think we deserve a little bit more than that. So you can homebrew that and say that for every number or percentage that you roll over, you would get a... Um, an extra 5% uh, over. So the, the, the challenge rating is going to be 15. The guy that in this party that's the most outspoken is the human noble. 
He's got the most finesse when it comes to persuasion. So I'm going to go to his sheet. Now, it doesn't mean he'll, he'll succeed, but he has a higher chance. So he's proficient with persuasion. He's got a plus four. So if he rolls a 15 or higher for every one point of 15 or higher, it's going to add to this. So let's see what happens. So I'm going to have him roll in the dice tower. So he's going to roll persuasion. He's going to persuade Baratheon to, to give them a little bit more gold. So drag and drop this into the tower. And he just rolled a 15. So the guy says, all right, I'll give you 60%. So basically, he negotiated it up higher. Now, I would allow maybe one more round, but it wouldn't be the same thing. So the dwarf in the party, the old grumpy guy, he's like, nah, I think you better give us a little more than that. I think uh, we deserve it. We're the heroes. Um, so he has intimidation. Now, he's not as good at intimidating as his friend is at convincing. But if he rolls over a 15, he has a higher, he can raise this up. If he fails, though, that's going to send this back to like 45. So let's see what happens. So the dwarf is saying, hey, if you don't give us more for that, I'm going to bust you in the nose. So he puts his fist up and he shakes it in front of the guy's face. Same challenge rating. It's a 15 or higher, but this is intimidation now. So to drag and drop this onto the dice tower. Wow, what do you know? He also rolled a 15. So that's going to be 65%. So now the proprietor's like, okay, fine, fine, 65. So the dwarf looks at everyone and they kind of shrug like, yeah, okay. So he just negotiated. You guys just won themselves 10% more uh, gold or, or loot. So once you're done with that, then you hit the down arrow. And that distributes all of this equipment, converts it over to um, coins, if if any. And that if it has anything to be sold, it'll be distributed amongst them. So if you click this over, it converts that to gold. And then you hit the down arrow. And that will also get rid of whoever wanted the assignments. And it, it, it converts the gold and, and converts it across. So the party got about 90 gold distributed. And there's a couple straggling coins here. So the Fantasy Grounds doesn't automatically convert these. So I can change the, the, 20, the two, 2 gold into 20 uh, silver. So we can go 24 silver now and get rid of the 2. So that, that can be distributed. So if I hit the down arrow, that gets rid of 20. So it has to be divisible by 5. And then if you wanted to, you can convert these into silver too. So, or into copper. So if you took those four, that would be 42. Get rid of the silver. And then you can distribute that down to the pennies. So basically, now there's only two copper left that cannot be divided. But that's how you would do that uh, manually. There are modules that help you convert that. But basically, that's that's what you have there. So if you get that runt, in this case, the, the, the survivor of this attack, um, you avoid those traps in the woods. And then you also have the ability to kind of make this more interesting. You could, you've gained a little NPC ally at this point. And then you've also learned something about the fortress or the, the Kragma hideout that's coming up. So that's important for this game to, to flow. So... Here's what the goblins know. This is the table that I made. So we're going to roll. Uh, we're going to have the same players um, basically ask the little dude what's going on with the what's what's going on at the hideout. So the human noble is going to roll. He has to roll a 10 or higher, basically. Or we can just roll on this table. Uh, so let's just see what happens. So I'm going to have him roll his uh, persuasion. So he rolled a 15 or so 19, so that would probably give him, you know, this information here about Clark. Or we can roll and just see what randomly. Yeah, so both times, even with the, the roll that's over, the challenge rating, or that, it gives him this third one. So he, they know a lot of stuff right now. They know that Clark received this messenger. and That's a really revealing thing. So that alarms the group. So they're really worried about their patrons. So they make haste to the goblin uh, hideout. So that's just something that you could do to kind of make this interesting. Another thing is to have some handouts like for the goblins themselves. Like if you wanted to show them during this combat, 
Um, it's, it's a good good idea to use some of the imagery that comes with the module if there is any. So in this case, under the campaign settings, under the, uh, the images and maps, there's some artwork that comes with Lost Mine, and it's called Artwork. And then if you click this goblins thing, you can use this as a prop to share with your group. So when the goblins attack, you have that link ready to go. You just pop it up, right click on the little on the image, go to sharing and share records. So that's how you share images and maps. And they'll see this little image. And you'll notice there's five goblins here and only four in the attack. So that means one of them must still be back at the camp or maybe this is Clark. So it's hard to say, but nonetheless, um, there's things that you can do to kind of make this adventure more more interesting and fun. And then as far as the, the overall map goes, if you are going to go to the goblin hideout, you could say it's over here. So this is the ambush. And then if you're going to use the goblin hideout, I have another map that I've that I've sourced that's third party. It doesn't come with the adventure, but it, it's different. Um so if you go to the uh, Lost Mine of Fandelver, in this case I call it Enhanced, but it's really not. It's just a, something I called it so that I can you know, recall it really quickly. So there's a lot of images on here that I that I imported. But uh, if you wanted to add more maps, so here's the, uh, let's go with the uh, Goblin Hideout or the... Uh, in this case, there's a goblin ambush. There's a dead horse. Yep, that's the horses I used. And then there's the lion shield coster, which is the, a building that's inside of Phandalin that you could use. So if you find these on online in your own little areas um, for you know for resources, there's there's that. So you you have places where you know, you can find really nice assets to add to this. There's the Heavy Forest Road, which is, I believe, uh, a, a battle map, if I remember right. Or maybe not. Maybe it's this one. No, you can use this. This is the, the Goblin Ambush, basically. Or you can use this for the Goblin Trail. So if they, if they fail their negotiations with the Goblin and they have to go on the trail on their own, you can link that map and use that for your next encounter if you wanted to go that way. And then let's see, where is the Kragma hideout? So looks like, let me look here. I'll just go to hideout, see if there's, I know I have a map for it. Let's see, map, red brand. So this is the hideout that for the red brands. But there is a map for the Lost Mine of Fandelver um, Kragma hideout. So you could use that and link that here in the actual um, links here. And then you can use that to run that part of the encounter when you get to that, that point. But that would be kind of like a part two or maybe a second session. So the first session you would run from, from Neverwinter to this point. And that might take you one or two times. And then after that, you could decide to go to Fanolin or follow the trail and uh, try to rescue or liberate your, your patron. So it really depends on what you want to do. But that's uh, most of what I have right now. I do want to mention that a lot of this artwork and these maps are not what comes in the original uh, module. I've used these to kind of make it more interesting and like cooler looking and I didn't even put line of sight on this map I mean if you wanted to you could put some terrain on here to kind of show these trees so I unlock the map and if I go to line of sight you can see I don't have anything on here but if I wanted to I can use the terrain tool and click on the line tool and just kind of click around these trees to add a little bit of shade and shadow to the map so that it's not just generic and then you can add this as you go. You don't have to be perfect. And I think that this kind of gives you the impression that there's trees there, but it's not overwhelming to where it's actually covering up the whole map. So there's things that you can do to kind of kind of mitigate this. So you know, you can make these any way you want. They don't have to be perfect. 
and they just kind of give you an idea of of what what you might be able to achieve with with fantasy grounds. So these are just suggestions. You could do whatever you want, but these are just ways that you know you can add or embellish to the map. So you can add this line of sight in here or these terrain features just to kind of give the players an idea of the scope of this forest. It gives them an idea of where the tall trees are. And it doesn't really take a lot of lot of work to put these in. They're pretty fairly fairly straightforward. I mean you're just kind of just clicking around. You don't have to go right to the edge of the tree either. That's a common mistake that people will go right up to the very edge. It's not necessary. You just kind of click around and especially with a natural feature like a tree, like these bushes right here. You know, you don't need to put every little single thing in here. This is just for you for reference, and it, you can kind of make the map a little bit more immersive and, and a less generic and not so, you know, so limiting. So you could do that if you wanted to. This would be something you could do before you start the encounter. And then being that it's outdoors, we want to go to the lighting tool. And I'm going to set this up to where it's like evening, like not dark, but evening time. So if you go to the uh, ambient lighting and you go to the preset and you go to dusk, that will add that to your to your map for, for your ambient lighting. And then when you come in here, you're going to turn on the, the ambient lighting. So you have a kind of a, a dimmer map with some shadows cast here. If you claim one of these tokens, like for instance, there's a dwarf, you can see the shadows coming off the trees. And as you move, the shadow moves too. So that's kind of a cool thing. So you could add that if you want to. But just remember, the more stuff you add, the more complexity you're going to have on your, your battle maps. But that's basically how that would work um, if you're going to add line of sight to these. These are third parties. So if you buy the actual module, uh, those already have the line of sight in there. So for the uh, Lost Mine of Fandelver for the maps, if you click on that, you go to the Kragma hideout, this is what you're getting with the module. And in there, it already has a line of sight set up for you. So if you unlock this and go to the line tool here, or line of sight, you can see all of that put in there. So it's already done for you. And if you're getting a little bit of lag, or maybe there's some, you know, there might be too many of these lines, these little dots are what creates the, the problems with lag and such. So you could go to the selection tool, double click on one of these points, and that would select all the points. And then you can uh, click Simplify Occluders, and that'll get rid of some of these dots. So it's not so invasive like you can actually um, simplify these so that your performance isn't going to be as as rugged so you can um, take these and kind of simplify these these dots here so that it's not taking up too much uh, memory sense so some of these maps have too much i think the ca caverns are the worst like those have the most line of sight on them like some of these might be redundant, but anyways, you get the idea. But see, if you take out too many, it's going to break the... So you can only do a little bit without breaking the map. But that's uh, that's kind of a tip. But anyway, so when you have the actual maps, you're going you're gonna to get the line of sight already. But I have my own custom map, so that's why I didn't have it set up that way. And then it, in my assets folder, I do have a, a campaign folder. And inside of here are some, you know, some props. And, like, there's the horse that I had. And then if you wanted to, there's the encounter. So you have all these encounter maps. So there's the goblin ambush. And then if you, there's some marker tokens. So if you want to use tokens and such on your maps, like I have all these banners that I might use for like the NPCs that are traveling on a, on a map. You can use the, these as kind of like your banners. And these are factions in the Forgotten Realms. So they, they're themed also. Uh, and then, of course, 
you can add your own portraits if you want to kind of give you more immersion. And then in the, uh, in the images here, under campaign, there's the buildings that are in Fandolin. So if you were going to, uh, you know, try to make the town a little bit more detailed, you could do so. And there's some uh, assets that you can get out there that are um, very, very nicely made. And you can actually expand upon the actual adventure so that you're not just using the same old stuff over and over. So this uh, this folder here has a lot of buildings. It's taken a while to open it because the maps are really big. So you got to be careful with the map file size because this is the kind of thing you'll get. And it's it's trying so hard to, to lift these up. But basically, these are all the buildings that are inside of the of a Lost Mine. So here's the Stonehill Inn. So if you wanted to uh, use that, you could. Stonehill Inn is one of the main buildings in town. So this is a cool looking place here. So if you you can create an image record with this and then add this to the campaign and then add your line of sight as you need to. So not all the buildings are detailed uh, as far as locations and such. So you can expand on your adventures in the town itself. So I'm going to expand this view. So this is just some of the artwork here. It's pretty nice. So these are third party, but you can add your own line of sight and that sort of thing. And then I found a map that that actually um, kind of it's kind of nice for the town. So I'm gonna create an image record and take this and expand it out, and then you can have like a a town map, and you can link all those other maps to these buildings. So this is just something you could do to kind of spruce up your game. So here's the tribe or trail where your party members would come in. And there's Baratheon's uh, provisions and the smithies right across the way. There's the Stonehill Inn. And uh, if you have this, there's another module that I found under the uh, DMs Guild. And it's called the um, A Lost Mine of Fendelver um, Companion called Tavern of the Sleeping Giant. So the Sleeping Giant is kind of where the, um, that's where the Red Brand's hideout was. So you can take it over, and there's actually maps for it, and there's even, um, you know, there's some assets for it, and then it even talks to you about how to run it. There's a reference manual, and it gets into, you know, what what can be done, and here's the deed for it. You can restore it. It tells you, like, what needs to be fixed. So this could be something that you could restore after the red brands are, are taken care of, or maybe later on after the adventure. So there's a lot of stuff you can do in this area. And then if you want to continue even further, you can add the D&D Essentials modules, which will even go further. So it's just up to you how you want this to go. So I think I've rambled enough. It gives you some idea of what some things you can do to, to make the adventure more interesting and memorable, and also creates a little bit more uh, immersion and, and uh playability. So hopefully I'll see you around again. Uh, enjoy your weekend and uh, hopefully you'll be able to play in some games soon and have some fun with your friends and family. God knows we need that. So I will see you guys around. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.